How are you all? It's wonderful to worship the Lord, eh? May we never come to hear a person but to worship the Lord. I'm finding out a place to put this, sorry. Well, my, that was my father, for those who are visiting, my father, Ken Grenfell, who just came and spoke, and he basically preached my sermon, so we can all go. We're good, right? I love it when that happens. We don't talk about these things beforehand. We really don't. We don't live together. I don't, certainly don't live with my parents anymore. So, and uh, thank goodness, he said. That's great. He does love me, I promise. But, uh, but it's just good to be with God's people. It's good to see you all. It really, really is. Uh, we have an encounter night coming this week. That's Saturday night. We have encounter night. Just a night of worship. And sorry about that. Sometimes leads to the prophetic, sometimes don't. But we just come to worship the Lord. And uh, so I would encourage you to come. It's this week, Saturday night. Details on the website. And we have it the first Saturday of every month. And it's just amazing. Just some of the things that we've seen God do. And just to worship and love the Lord together. We good? Yeah. It's good to see you all. So, we're in the middle of a series of Galatians. And uh, actually, I, I just have to quickly tell you guys a little funny story. Can I tell you a little funny story? Yeah. Then we'll pray, and then we'll get into the Word. We have a, a gentleman who's been working uh, with us. We just moved into a new house, and so, you know, it's interesting. Boxes and moving and packing and all of the rest. And thanks for all of those who helped. With, that was just awesome of those who came out and helped. But we, uh, we have this gentleman working at a house. He's becoming a friend of mine, and he, like myself, he has an interesting history. He wasn't always with the Lord. He loves the Lord, passionate about the Lord, but he's, he was good at being in the world before that. <laughs> we'll put it that way. He was very good at it. And, uh, and so he, he's a big guy, strong guy, and uh, he comes over to the house, and I had to leave, and there was, like, you know, when you move in, you have so many different contractors coming through, and we had this bunch of contractors coming through that I didn't know. So I called him, and I was downstairs, I went upstairs, and my wife was going to be there. I was coming to the office to prepare and spend the day with the Lord, and I'm just leaving my wife there with all these people that I don't know, right? So, so I said to him, hey, um, I know him. We had breakfast together. It was early in the morning. I said, listen, I've got to leave today. I know you're going to be here all day. If there's an issue, I don't know these guys coming here. Uh, can, we just, can, I just, can you just make sure Jenna's okay? So if there's anything, can you, you know, deal with it? <laughs> Obviously, he has a rough background. He looks up to the Lord and he goes, Lord, the pastor said I could. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> he's like... I'm going to get him now. So I was like, no, don't destroy these guys. I just, and he just smiles. He's like, Lord, the pastor said I could. I just started laughing. It was just so funny. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. <laughs> it was funny. So I just have to share that. Anyway, can we pray? I encourage you, whenever we pray before, uh, don't just listen to my words. Pray in your heart, out loud if you want, just not too loud. And uh, ask the Lord for revelation, ask the Lord for change, ask the Lord for the penetration of truth. Because unless he reveals it, intellectualism won't help, yeah? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is living and active, it is sharp, it is powerful, it has all authority, it will never pass away. I thank you for the power of revelation in a human heart. And I pray for revelation this morning to pierce hearts, to transform lives, for repentance, to change the way we think, and let us see you for who you are. We bless your name, Lord. Holy Spirit, we come to your word with you. You are the author. And we come to your word with you. Speak to us. Teach us. Impart to us. In Jesus' name. Amen. People often ask me, how did you get revelation like that out of Scripture and all of that? Well, honestly, that's just a gift from the Lord. But I would encourage you, when you read Scripture, go with the author. Whenever I read Scripture, I always just, for a moment, say, Holy Spirit, reveal this. It's yours. So I just, for a moment, reveal this. Show me. Teach me. Speak to me. Then you read. You'll be amazed at what he opens your eyes to. Amen. So we're in the book of Galatians, and uh, if you weren't here the last few weeks, I obviously cannot give a full recap. It's very difficult to do so, 
And, um, but the world right now <clears throat> is in great need of believers who can be salt and light, especially in our area, in our school district, in our nation, in all the various issues we face. We need believers that can be genuine, genuine salt and light. And I've discovered that you cannot be salt and light unless there's actually genuine partnership with the Lord. You can know so much about God. You can even know so much of the scriptures. But unless there's genuine partnership with the Lord, you will not have an impact. And it becomes a debate. It becomes arguments. It becomes the bony religious finger of we're better than you. And none of that actually transforms and changes a person or society. And if we can just understand just the two different covenants which we'll get into today there's many covenants in the bible but old, old testament and new testament you'll see even the prevalent names of the old testament israel and the prevalent name in the new testament the church israel means to contend with god that's what it means contention with god because he put the law into that nation he put his moral dictates and his moral requirements for righteousness with him he put it into the earth and they contended with it and there's a constant contention with God. That is the, what you see largely in the Old Testament. I mean, obviously much more, but in the context of what we're talking about. The word church, Jesus used it only twice. Ecclesia, or Ecclesia, was, as I've preached on before, was the, it was actually a Greek phrase, but the Romans put it into practice, was the power arm of the government of Rome. That's what it was. And Jesus said, I will build my Ecclesia. We think Jesus came to establish a religion. He came to establish his government on the earth through his people. And the ecclesia were hand-picked people that were close to the emperor, that knew his heart, that lived there with him in the palace or in the whatever you called it in those days, different words. They lived there. They knew his heart. They knew his motivations. They, they knew him so well that they didn't always have to run back. What do you want to do? They would just implement his intents and his heart. That's what the word church means to these people in the Bible. In these days and he said I will build my church I will pick people I will save people I want all people to become to I'm not going to deal with that but I want all people but they are chosen and they will implement my government and my power and my authority and so you see because of the righteous requirement actually I think I wrote something down God's people moved from old to new from contention with God due to his righteous requirement to partnership as a family member due to his righteous requirement because now it's fulfilled in his son <laughs> anytime God's people are trying to earn what has already been given it will not end well when you try to earn what's been given it looks good on the outside we can play church well we can be very religious we can look but you're actually scorning the cross I'm not being harsh, but we are, and we don't realize it, and it's a trap that we fall into over and over. It's the natural inclination of a human heart. It's the first thing Adam did with the new nature. First thing, he tried to fix it himself, covered himself up. So, be honest with yourself. Does your relationship with the Lord look more like contention? And a guilt cycle to victory, and a guilt cycle to victory, and a guilt cycle to victory, or it's one of partnership and worship. <laughs> because in my own life, I was crippled with insecurity. I was crippled with just issues in my heart. I don't even know where they came from. I just had a wonderful family. But just living life. And I did leave, live to please people. And I did live to all these things that be dealing with the Galatians. And that's why it was such a powerful book to me. But I also recognize that unless I learn to be free and unless I learn to understand how God sees me and see him the right way and approach him in freedom and love, I just seem to go through a cycle. Guilt, fasting, and breakthrough. Guilt, fasting, breakthrough. Sorry, thank you. I'm sorry, thank you. I'm sorry, thank you. Hello? Who knows what I'm talking about? It's just me. It's just the seven honest people. <laughs> you guys can all leave. You've passed. <laughs> and friends, that's what's happening here in the Galatian churches. This book is written to the churches in Galatia. We'll read it. But it's to a whole region. Every one of these, Iconium, Derby, Antioch, Lystra. All of these churches were started in revival, power, signs, wonders, miracles. 
And then these Judaizers came in, as I've been saying, these people that were saying, yes, Jesus, but you also need to add this and add this and add this and add this, circumcision, Sabbaths, holy days, all these kinds of things, these religious things, which made them look better than the new believers. We actually know what we're doing. Let us come tell you how to be a Christian. And you ended up with the Jesus plus issue. And what happens is every single time that happens, it happened throughout church history, it's happening right now all over the world, that there's, you get saved in power. God transforms your heart. Things change. I, I'm new. I love Jesus. Man, this, and then people with a good heart come up. Okay, well, now you need to do this, 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 this. And we actually move, which is exactly what happened in the churches in Galatia. They move from having the power and the love of God and shining brightly to playing church, to being good at church. I can play this church game really well. They move from having impact and power and transformation to having debates and arguments and discussions. And the light is gone. And the world says, that's not attractive to me at all. Friends, I've experienced the power of God. Many of you have too. I've seen people get out of wheelchairs. I've seen things move under my hands when I pray. I've, we've experienced that. And what happens when we see God move like that, then we go to, I must pray more. I must sustain this. There's more legalism in the charismatic world, I find, than in most others. I'm not making friends today, but I'm okay. I'm okay. I have my friend, Jen, my wife. <laughs> and my two children don't have a choice. So we're good. Because this need to earn is part of the old nature that died in Christ. That's why I say my dad preached my sermon. I know what it's like. I've experienced seasons of my life where the power of God flowed in such ways that I cannot even explain. Just, I'm just being real. It's got nothing to do with me. It just happened. And then it starts to shift. And you think, oh, I better... And you pray 10 times harder, you fast 10 times more, you do all, and you don't realize, as Galatians 5 says, you've actually fallen from grace. You've gone off the foundation of what he laid, and you've gone to the foundation of what I can do to sustain something that he already has given. Hello? The desire is holiness. The desire is the power of God. The desire is the glory of God to become seen by the world with, that the church has answers that the world doesn't have. The miraculous, power, love, authority. That is the desire. But Titus 2 says it's the grace of God that will teach you to say no to ungodliness. It's the grace of God that will teach you to live, to live holy and upright lives. It's the grace of God that will transform your heart to such a degree that you become eager to do what's good. You don't just not do what's bad because you know it's not right. You actually don't want to do it because you're not interested in it. And you become eager to do what is actually good. The Bible's Titus, the grace of God. And it's a school, it's not a moment, it's not instant. And so we become each other's Holy Spirit. How can you do that? Oh, you don't realize what you're doing. Every time you put law on a person, it stirs up sin. You've just made it harder for that person. You are not their Holy Spirit. Hello. My wife tells me that when we fight. You know, my Holy Spirit. Oh boy. We don't fight a lot. Relax. <laughs> I hope you understand. Just you see my heart in it. And that's what happened here to these Galatian churches. That's what happened. And they went from power and transformation to playing church. Galatians 3, verse 1 to 4. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? As I said last week, that word bewitched is the actual word for witchcraft. Because witchcraft, the attack of witchcraft on the church is so prevalent today and people think spells and it's not that. It's this attack of this double prong attack that happens. Can I, mostly this, what happened here, Galatia was in the northern provinces of what is now not, uh, Turkey. And they were known as wealthy, fickle people. Wealthy, chop and change. 
And I find this same issue that they have here, we have in here in Northern Virginia. It's this double pronged attack of witchcraft, which is carnality and legalism. Carnality is just the works of the flesh, the sins of the flesh. I just do whatever I want. And, but legalism says I have to put on the good Christian mask. I have to show face. I have to be a good Christian. I cannot, cannot let people know. So the Christian mask becomes bigger. Legalism goes up. And we get told more and more every Sunday, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. So legalism increases. And the Bible says law will stir up sin. Through law is knowledge of sin. By the law, sin is provoked. And it gets worse. Carnality gets worse in our heart. It gets worse in our life. But now I also have to hide it. So carnality increases in private. In private. And we get worse. But we look better. And we get worse. But we look better. I'm a good Christian, I am. <laughs> People say, well, if they really knew my heart, if they, every preacher knows that to be true. They really saw some of the stuff we have to deal with. <laughs> and that double pronged attack of carnality and legalism throughout history is what stops and breaks revivals and awakenings and power. It's not sin that stops it. Sin is why it starts. It's when we take what God's doing, now we're going to earn what he's given us. Oh, friend, self-righteousness. That's the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Look at Galatians 3, so we just read. Who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask only, you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith? Are you so foolish? Isn't that still amazed that these people that he's talking about are sitting there when they're reading this? Imagine that. Kevin's come and pulled us all aside. He's brought Jesus plus, And now we're reading... There's these people in your midst that are causing you to be foolish. Imagine how you'd feel. Because truth is above offense. Should I say that again? Yeah, truth is above offense. Truth is truth. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and work miracles among you do so by the works of the law? Or by the hearing with faith. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteous. I said last week, performance after initial belief will always lead to performance instead of belief. Jesus said, just believe. Just believe. If you can just believe, all things are possible. Okay. So, we're going to go read together. Can we read the Bible together? I'm going to read... A lot. And you're all just so excited because you love the Bible and we're not going to fall asleep. So I'm going to read probably the whole chapter. I encourage you, you're even welcome to read out loud with me if you want. But can we read together and please let's put our thinking hats on. Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man. We discussed that last week. But through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brethren who are with me to the churches in Galatia. I'm actually going to read it here. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him. I said this last week. Not from a doctrine, not from a religion, from a person. From the relationship that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the works, oh wait, in the grace of Christ. He called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not a different gospel. The, the King James says to another, which is not another. And they're two different words. But there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you, then what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As you have said before, so now I say again, if anyone, they're sitting there, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? The NIV says, am I still trying to win the approval of man? Why? Because Paul had spent his whole life 
playing the religious game and winning at it and earning the approval of man and doing everything to be the best at the religious game. And here he sees the Judaizers come in and what was started in power and signs and wonders. He says, guys, we're going to repeat the same things. And he says, we cannot let this happen again. Now we covered that last week. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Now let me pause here for a second. Anyone who knows Paul's epistles given by the Holy Spirit, obviously Scripture, the Word of God. By the way, Peter calls Paul's writing Scripture, and Paul calls Peter's writing Scripture, which is an amazing thing, but we won't get into that now. All his letters, he is the... Over 120 times in the New Testament, Paul uses the word grace. More than all the other New Testament writers combined. More than all the other New Testament, he champions his doctrines of grace, the unmerited favor of God, favor that is upon your life that you had nothing to do with because of the merits of Christ's life on your behalf. He also champions sonship, your sons, your daughters, you're loved, you're accepted in the beloved, you are made holy. Yet he calls himself a bondservant. Yet he's championing grace and sonship. And he says, no, I'm a servant. And I had many people ask me, why does he refer to himself as a bondservant? Do you know what a bondservant actually is? Now, these people would have understood this. Sometimes we've got to go have some cultural understanding. George Taylor, one of the founders, one of the couples, George and Patsy Taylor, they're at home right now. But one of the founders that uh, founded the church, I think they're watching online if they are. Hi, George. He taught us this years ago. And a bond servant was this. A bond servant was a person, if you were a Hebrew slave for all the reasons and there's many different types, but if you were a Hebrew slave, you would serve six years. Six is the number of man, what man can do. You would serve six years in the seventh year, you'd, be, you'd go free. But if while you were a slave, you became married to a, a wife who was a slave and she was not going to go free, and maybe you had some children, you would go to your master. This is in Exodus and Leviticus. And you say, master... Um, I know I'm being free. And when they were free, they were paid. They were given livestock and all sorts of things. They, they suddenly would free with money, with land, and they'd be able to live as free men. And he said, you know, I, I so love my wife, because it's against the law for her to be freed. I so love my wife and my children that I will choose to remain a servant in your house because I want to stay with them. That they were free, but they chose because of love. And some masters would give them what they would have gone anyway, and they still lived and served, but at least they had. Some didn't. So he would risk it all because of his love for her. And George Taylor painted this amazing picture because what they would do, actually, they would take this man and they would take him to the doorposts. Remember Moses, the blood on the doorposts? They would take him to the doorpost with the, the Elohim, the little Jewish little thing that they put on the doors. And under Elohim, they would take his ear and they would stick it on the doorpost and drive an um, a, a awl, A-W-L, like a metal awl, through his ear. Boom. And the husband would shed his blood on the doorpost. And then George Taylor painted this picture of a husband sitting by the night, by the fire at night, and the wife standing behind him, just touching his ear, knowing, he's here for me. <laughs> Paul says, I'm a bondservant. But I'm not the husband. Jesus Christ is the husband. And he was pierced. And his blood was shed on the doorpost. For me. That's what he's saying. And because of that, the husband became like the wife again. I'll become like you so that you can maybe be free if you choose it. Paul is saying, My, our husband, Jesus, we are the bride of Christ. Our husband chose to become like us so that his blood would be put on the doorpost so that we can no longer be slaves and we can be free. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I've given my whole life to this. If you're in ministry... If you're a preacher, teacher, apostle, prophet, evangelist, whatever you call yourself, you are a bondservant. You have given yourself and your life to the service of the bride of Christ. You are not the husband. 
Verse 11, that was just a side note. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. I don't know if anyone here can say that. Think about this. He never went to Sunday school. He never, nothing, nothing. He knew the scriptures, the Torah, off by heart. But he had a revelation of Jesus Christ, and he understood the gospel. Directly from God, the gospel was preached to Paul. And he received it. He was never taught it. That's why it was so pure. Now, none of us can say that, yet all of us can say that. Because unless something comes into your heart by revelation of the Holy Spirit, it's information, but it has no transformation power in your life. So none of us can say that, but all of us should say that. And he says, For you have heard, and now he goes into the whole Judaism and the tradition of the elders which we kept. This was what I was before, but now I'm this. You have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I advanced, that word is I profited, I, it was I won the race of religion. I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the laws of God, no, for the traditions of my fathers, for all the stuff they had added to the law that wasn't even in the Old Testament. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through His grace to reveal His Son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately have this confer with flesh and blood. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem, that's where the main church was at the time, to those who were apostles before me. But I went to Arabia, and then returned to Damascus, where he got saved. There's so much just in that. When a person gets saved, often the Lord will remove them from their situation. They remove them from those people, from that family, from that group of friends. He removes them, and some part of your life is like in Arabia. It's like a desert. It's just, but you're a new person. But then he takes you back to where you got saved. Because now you're strong enough to be there and stay who you are. And he went to, back to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother, now, verse 20, now concerning the things which are right to you before God, I do not lie. Why does he have to say that? Because what he's actually saying, he's talking about the proof of his apostleship. That's, if you want to be technical, that's what he's dealing with here. Why is it so important? He's saying, I received the exact same gospel that the, that the 12 guys who walked with Jesus for three years that were taught, that were instructed, and all the details and all the stuff he gave them, the 40 days before he left, speaking of the things of the kingdom, that were there at his resurrection. One of them, the rest ran. One of them went to the cross with him. Everything he taught them, I received the exact same thing without talking to them, and I'm preaching the exact same stuff that they're preaching. How does that happen? Basically is what he's saying. It comes from heaven. And it's the exact same. And we hadn't met. We hadn't talked. And for many years I did this before I even met them. And if you were a lawyer, you would understand that if you had a witness, an eyewitness, a chief, the, the person who was going to destroy your case, if they were the, the prosecution's strength, and they're going to destroy your case completely, and then he turns, and he's been a witness, and then he comes back and said, I was wrong. There's no way they can win anymore. That was Paul to the Jews. He was their number one guy. And he talks about, I received the exact same truth. And because of his knowledge of the Torah and of Scripture, he was so brilliant, and I won't get into this now, but if you go look historically, many commentators will tell you he was by, his father was a Pharisee, Acts 22 and 26. He was given up by the age of nine because his father, who was the chief Pharisee in an entire region, said, this young boy at the age of nine is so excellent, I no longer can teach him. And he sent him to sit at the feet of Gamaliel. He was well advanced. He was brilliant. He was so clever, so skilled, and he was the number one. And God turned him on a dime just like that. Boom. But take note of this. What does Paul say? I wasn't taught, it wasn't taught to me, but it came through a revelation 
Did it say from Jesus? The NIV says that, but in the Greek, from Jesus or of Jesus? Of. Came through the revelation of Jesus. I had an encounter with the risen Christ, and when I saw him, I understood the gospel. It's relational. It's not intellectual. Jesus didn't come and say, A, point A, point B, point C, point D. I had a revelation of Jesus, and I understood the gospel. I didn't have the words for it yet. It's like when you got saved. I don't have the words. I just know something in my heart. I, I don't know how to explain it yet, but it's in my heart. So Jesus was revealed to Peter, I mean to Paul. And then a few years later, he says, now Jesus, re Jesus was revealed in me. It's, everyone's like that. It goes from Jesus being revealed to us. Wow, he is who he says he is. He is the son of God. He's the Messiah. He's the king. He has all power and authority. It's true. God is real. Wow, wow. Phew, Jesus revealed to you. A few years later, Jesus wants to be revealed in you. And you begin to look like him. That's what we just read. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see... Oh, we read that. So sorry. Afterwards, I went to the regions of Syria and Cilicia. Cilicia was actually Tarsus, Paul's home. He went back and faced the people he grew up with. How many of you have done that? You get saved. God takes you. You move countries, states, or whatever. Years, years go by. You go back a different person. And now you've got to face your family. That's what happened to Paul. You're like, oh boy. And they treat you like nothing's changed, but you've changed. Hello? You're different. You don't, and you don't want to go there and, oh, I'm a different person. And that's just... Many of you are smiling. Oh, yeah. That's hard. Yeah. Well, it's according to the book. Don't worry. Paul did it. Afterward, I went into the region of Syria and Cilicia, and I was unknown by faith to the churches of Judea who were in Christ, but they were hearing only, who, He who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God in me. You know, some of you who may have an issue in your life, I'm not talking about some terrible issue, that you cannot see how God can turn it for good. You could not imagine it. Just like Paul. Paul was ISIS, friends. Killed women, children, men. God took that man and turned it for good. I want to speak to you today a little bit more about the power of twos. Are we good? Are we, good? Are we still good? Two ages, the Bible speaks of two ages two in the New Testament, two types of righteousness, two trees, two kingdoms, two Adams, two husbands, two covenants, two kingdoms, uh, two, two, two. And I want to speak to you a little bit about that. What did Galatians 1.4 say? It says... <clears throat> Actually, can we pause for a second? Just the Holy Spirit prompting me. If you have something in your life that you say, there's no way God can turn this for good. I'm, we're not going to ask you what it is. No one's going to ask you. It could be something good. It could be, it's not some bad thing you're doing. But if you have something in your life, I cannot see how God can turn this for good. Can you stand? No one's going to ask you. Just stand right now. It's just what I feel the Lord saying. going to give it another second whoever you are I'm telling you God can turn it for good <laughs> he can can we as a congregation just lift these wonderful people up in prayer Father I thank you I thank you that you can turn anything for the good for those that love you you can always win. Always. You've never lost. And Father, we lift these people up and I ask in the name of Jesus that you will show them grace that teaches them and trains them and that turns these things for good. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
So I'm going to just be honest. I'm just thinking about how I should do this. Can we go to Romans chapter 5? Romans chapter 5. I know we're in Galatians, but I'm going to do a detail from Galatians. And I want to give you a little bit of the basics of some things today, as much as I can. Romans chapter 5 and 1 Corinthians 15. I was going to read all the scriptures for you, but I will skip through it. 1 Corinthians 15, and you can go from verse 20 to 58, which is like the whole chapter. So, but it talks about Paul, I mean, it talks about Jesus as the last Adam. It's one of the names given to Christ, the last Adam. We have two Adams in the Bible. The first Adam being Adam, well done. The last Adam being Jesus. And some people talk about him being the second Adam, but that's not real and that's not good. Why? He was the last Adam. Adam was the beginning of all things for humanity. Jesus is the last Adam. He is the last one who would come and restart and renew and bring a brand new beginning to mankind. There's not going to be another one. So the Bible calls him last Adam. Now let's go to Romans. Actually, I'll read it now. Let's go to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. It says this, Therefore, just as through one man, that's first Adam, who one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sinned. Because the understanding of the New Testament, like we are in, in our father Abraham, we are in Christ. Adam and Eve were the first. And before they ever had children, they sinned. And so everyone who comes from them, everyone in humanity, is born on the earth with a sin nature. It was bent and corrupt in the garden. I think we, we, we're good with that, right? We understand that. So they're born. And because of this, we all sinned, right? We were born with it. It's the sin nature. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law was in the world, for, sorry, for until law was in the world, but sin is not imputed. Some translations say counted or taken into account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. What does that mean? That's weird. Okay, what that means is Adam was the only one ever, until Moses, he was the only one to receive the law. Which was what? Don't eat of the tree. One rule, one law, and he broke it. Boom. But from Adam, and through that sin, death entered. I've explained this before to those who do the discovery. It's like Mordor in the Lord of the Rings. It's like death was the prevailing system over the earth now. Death entered. That was the environment. Death entered through that sin. And death still reigned even over those from Adam to Moses who had no law given to them. There was no law put into the earth. They had a moral conscience. They were born with a sense of right and wrong. But there was nothing given. There was nothing written. There was nothing clarified. And the Bible says that even in heaven, their sin wasn't being taken into account. Because through the law, the Bible says, is knowledge of sin. And there was no law. So even though they were doing bad things, they were not sinning according to the transgression like of Adam, because Adam knew. And it was not being taken into account. Does that make sense? But nevertheless, even though they weren't being judged for that, death still reigned. Because death had still entered through sin. Hello? Very simple, actually. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. That's when the law was given. Even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. Who is a type of him, capital H, that's Jesus, who was to come. The last Adam. But the free gift, that's eternal life, salvation, is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, if by Adam's sin we were all born, Ephesians 2 says you are born dead in your sin and your transgressions. You are born a sinner. Friends, we are not sinners because of sin we do. People are not sinners because of sin they do. People are sinners because of the sin of the first man. Hello? Very important to understand. Say, well, that's not fair. Yeah, I know. But that's the truth. It's not our stuff. It's not our sin that made us a sinner. It's the sin of the first man. 
And therefore we do stuff because we have a sin nature. People sin because it's within them when they're born. Nothing that they did, but because of the offense of the first man. Now it says this. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God. And the gift by the grace of the one man, capital M, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. That's Adam. For judgment came from one offense, resulted in condemnation. Everyone born dead in their sin and in their trespasses with death as the penalty. But the free gift which came from many offenses, all the stuff that was committed from then to whenever, to, to Christ, the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense, that's first Adam, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive, not earn, those who receive the abundance of grace, of unmerited favor placed on your life because of nothing that you did, how much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift, can we say gift? Yes. The gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ until we understand something of grace in our hearts. Yes, we need to study and understand it here, but in our lives it's revealed to us. We actually cannot reign in life. Life is just always trouble. It's the grace of God that will teach you to reign in life and not bow so quickly to the enemy. Not discipline, grace. Therefore, just as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men because he were born in sin and transgression, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's act, that's Jesus, the free gift came to all men. You say, well, that's unfair. We won't do that. Well, it's also unfair that you didn't earn it and it's given. Is Jesus not just? Is God not just? And the justifier. One man's righteous act, the free gift, came to all men, resulting in the justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, the sin of the one man. So also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Now it tells you, friends, so important, why did the law come? Moreover, the law entered that sin might increase. Some translations say that the offense might abound. <laughs> I'll read it again. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Those are two different words. Where sin abounded, that word is perio, okay, no, and it means to increase, to grow, to abound. But where grace abounded, that is superabounded, perizio, means over the above the amount and abounding that we can even count. Where sin abounded, grace superabounded. That's the best word I can. <laughs> Where sin reigned in, so moreover the law entered that the offense might increase, that sin may increase. But where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, the system of death and sin reigns, even so grace, the unmerited favor of God, might reign through the righteousness, through the through righteousness of Christ, to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I know that's a lot what I just said. But we have to understand something, that when we see this, are you guys still with me? This is, I studied this for years, so I get that I'm reading this, and I know it's a lot for some of you for, who are the first time. Romans 5 is like, you know when you go to a doctor's room and you see a skeleton? Romans 5 is the spine of the gospel. Without that, everything falls apart. Everything just falls apart. And this became so real to me, that sin is not taken into account where there is no law, verse 13. That the Bible says that sin, that through the law was added, why? To make sin increase. When the first time I read that, I was offended. I really was. I thought, no ways. That, that's wrong. 
The Bible says the law was given to make sin increase. The Bible says through the law is knowledge of sin. The Bible says they were not take, sin was not taken into account where there was no law. You see, in the Old Testament, in the Torah, in the Jewish understanding, they believed, there's even a proverb that says um, in a Bosch, in the Mishnah, it's, a, it's like an oral tradition. Uh, it says, more Torah, more life. In other words, in the center of the Torah was the law. Put law on yourself, put law on yourself, put law on yourself, and you'll be stronger. So Paul stands up, <laughs> the chief architect of the law to them, the, the, the most brilliant. And he stands up and he says, hey, guess what? We were all wrong. <laughs> he stands up and says, the law was added to make sin get worse. Imagine the Jewish rabbis. How can a holy God, because friends, there's nothing wrong with the law. The law is righteous and holy, and there's nothing wrong with grace. The problem is when you try and mix them. And that is what most Christians do. I live a little bit of law and a little bit of grace. The Bible says when you get saved, you're a new species on the earth, 2 Corinthians 5. Brand new, like never before seen. You get changed. I'm made new. I start fresh. I get a new nature. I'm righteous. I'm a son. Not a son. All these things. But then the Judaizers come in, in every church. Do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Good, well-meaning hearts. And now we have a little bit of law and a little bit of grace. If you mix two species, what do you have? You have a monster. You have a mongrel. And inside every person's heart, that happens. Back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Because it doesn't feel right to just stand on His grace alone. And trust Him that He will change you. Doesn't feel normal. Surely I must. <laughs> How can our holy God add something that will make sin increase? Why? Because he was after something much more important. What was it? He, w he used the law as a tool to reveal the condition of death in the human heart. Death reigned. Because of the sin of the one man. And he had to reveal to people, you cannot ever, by the strength of your flesh, find righteousness with me. So I will take the law. Why did, this, why did sin increase? Not that they did more bad things, they actually did. The day the law was added, 3,000 people died. The day the Holy Spirit was given, 3,000 people were saved. Why? <laughs> He had to reveal the condition of self-righteousness in the man's heart. It's the first thing Adam did. I will make clothes. I will fix it. I will cover it. Every other religion on the face of the earth relies on that for their salvation. Jesus said, no. I have to reveal the condition of death in the human heart. Death reigns. There's a condition of death. I have to reveal that. So freely from a heart of love, they can see it. So I have to add something to make matters get worse so they can see their state. So they fall to their knees and say, but by Jesus. That's, he uses complicated language. He was a lawyer. My friend's a lawyer. I've forgiven him many times. But that is what it means. Because it's far more important to reveal the condition of what is wrong with humanity. <laughs> You know, there's a far greater power than sin. And it's the power of grace. It's far greater power. And the, the modern day believer has this mongrel mixed inside of law and grace. And the power of grace is made null and void because we keep going back to, I can do it. I can do it. I can do it. I'm going to have to leave it there. I'll do this again next week, but I just want to show you quickly. The Bible says in Romans 6 that sin is our master. The Bible says the strength, what does it actually say? 
in 1 Corinthians 15, it says, A death where is your sting, a Hades where is your victory. For the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. The Bible calls sin, it personalizes sin, calls him the master. When you're born on the earth, sin is your master, like an old-fashioned slave master with a whip. Okay, Romans 6 talks about it. When you're born on the earth, you have a master, sin. The Bible in Romans 7 says that you have two husbands. Jesus is a husband, or the law, the Old Testament law. When you're born, you're married to the law. You're married to the law, and it's illegal to divorce the law because it's against the law. And it's, the law points out your sin, but it has no empowerment. It can't change you. It's just there to say, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And you're not allowed to divorce it. The law never dies. Never dies. The law is holy and righteous. The law, imagine having a husband that it itself never does, he never does anything wrong. Because he's perfect. He's the law. And he never dies. And he's always right. And he's never wrong. And you're always wrong. And he cannot help you. And he doesn't want to help you. He's just here to tell you how much you suck. <laughs> yeah, miserable. Right? This was the condition we were born into. And so we have this master, this personification of sin, the master of sin, the system of death, and sin is its employee. And he has two whips in his hand. This is the best thing I could find is a whip. <laughs> Very useless. But he has two whips in his hand. One, the devil made, the accusation. The other, God made, the law. The strength of sin is the law. And so he takes these two whips and he beats you back and forth like this. The system of death reigns. <laughs> so sin is your slave master holds these two whips. I just want to read this. It'll go faster. So what will happen is even when you do, what does sin want you to do? He wants to tempt you. So even when you do what sin wants, you tempt you, whatever, and it's a voice in your head that's not, you're not responsible for temptation. You're just responsible for when you do with it. It doesn't come from you. Understand that. Yeah. Be free from that. So sin comes along and tempts you, and you, you go into it, and you're like, all right. So your master, sin, has told you what to do. It's tempting you, and you do it. Then what does he do? He takes the law, the strength of the, the sin, the law is the strength of sin, and he whips you with the law. And he makes it, because it's the law, something God made, which on its own is holy and righteous. Look what you did. And because it's the law, it sounds like God in your mind. Look what you did. And he hit you with it. You're not good enough. Look what you did. How dare you? Do you know what people will say? You know what the Bible says. You know what the pastor said. Look what you did. And he whips you with something that God made that is holy. And to you... Now that sounds like God's voice because it's something he made. The devil will always twist and pervert. Then you finally do what your husband wants. Your husband is the law. So the law hits you enough, beats you enough, the abusive husband. Where you finally become and do what the law wants. And you finally do something right. And the devil takes up the other whip and accuses you. You think, you, you think you're good enough? Do you not know what you did yesterday? Do you not remember this? And he hits you. See it with God's people. Back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. <laughs> and they play church so well. But do they know Jesus? Red. The Bible says there's two husbands. So Jesus says, I got an idea. I'll come. I'll be pierced. And I'll be made like them. Because you cannot divorce the law and the law never dies. The only way to make that marriage null and void, according to the law, is you have to die. So Jesus said, I'll come and I'll die. And if they believe in me, they will now be identified as being crucified with Christ. Therefore, they've died. The marriage to the law is canceled. And they get raised with a new husband, Isaiah 54. For your husband is your maker. And what does he hold in his hand? Grace and truth. And so the enemy comes along and whoops you and he says, don't touch my bride. And he says, don't listen to that. 
Do you remember who you are? Do you remember what I've done? I've taken care of this legally. He has no authority over you. I love you. Let's look again who you actually are. I've made you new, so now that I can make you you. We all have to stop there. I'll go over that again maybe next week. Friends, the gospel of grace will teach you and train you to be freer than you've ever been. It will lead to holiness. It will lead to power. It will lead to genuine knowing his voice. But first you have to come to the place of the scandalous belief of everything you have because of nothing you did. Can we stand? I know I went a little long today. I thank you for your grace. <laughs> uh, I didn't mean that. Yeah, we are all weak. So, Josh. That was outstanding. It really was. I honestly believe with all my heart that one of the things that happened, particularly in the American church or the American society or America, out of well-meaning hearts, people taught other people how to get saved instead of why they needed to get saved. So they said, well, you just accept Jesus and everything will be fine. They said, okay, I'll do that. But they don't know why. You need conviction by the Holy Spirit. Deep conviction of what he's speaking about. Then you'll see, ah, Jesus. That's why I need him. Ken. Okay, just a reminder, we do have the baptism this afternoon. There should be a, that's the address, snap a pic of that, make sure if you're supposed to be doing that, then you're there on time at two. Uh, Kevin's going to, right here, this tall guy in the front, he's going to be in the back, that white door back there, giving out shirts for those who are getting baptized, so meet him back there, uh, and if you want to come watch what's happening, just be there at two o'clock. Otherwise, we have a ministry team over here for anything, if you'd like to get prayer, and uh, stay cool this afternoon. Bye. Good morning, Free Life Church. We're glad you're here. If you are visiting in person, please stop by the Connection Corner in the lobby to receive your welcome bag and learn more about Free Life Church. A member from our Connection team will be there to answer any questions you have. We look forward to meeting you. Baptisms are this afternoon. Please join us after church to share this joy with our brothers and sisters who are being baptized. Our next encounter night is coming up on June 12th at 6.30 p.m. Come join us for a powerful time of worship and praise. We want to honor our FLC seniors graduating this year. If you have a graduate in your family, please register them on our events page. We want to honor and pray for them on June 13th. Calling all golfers and aspiring golfers. Come join us for an afternoon of golf at Stonely Golf Club on June 25th at 11 a.m. Please see our events page to register before June 18th. Men, come join us at Freedom Center for a work party on June 26th, starting at 8 a.m. We want to support the local ministry at Freedom Center in North Leesburg by helping them with some general grounds maintenance. Special skills are not required to help. Freedom Center will provide water, snacks, lunch, and equipment, but you may also bring your own tools if you prefer. Need prayer? Our prayer team meets every week on Friday to pray. If you would like prayer, please fill out the electronic form or drop the request in the connect box. We would be honored to pray for you. Do you love to pray for others? If you are interested in joining the prayer team, please contact us at prayer at freelifechurchva.com. God is doing amazing things all around us. We continue to receive multiple testimonies each week and would love to see them keep coming. Email us what God is doing in your life at testimonies at freelifechurchva.com. Here at Free Life Church, we do believe in kingdom giving. There are three ways to give your tithes and offerings. We have a box located in the hallway outside the sanctuary, or you may give by text or through our website. There are other funds to which you can contribute as well, like the VBS fund or alms for those in need. 
thank you for your generosity. For more information about all of our upcoming events, please see the events page on our website. Thanks for tuning in.